The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Great stuff. We're going to get started shortly, everyone on the call. Thanks for your patience. Get your warm drinks and we'll, uh, we'll give it a couple of minutes just for those struggling with getting into the interface for the first time. Excellent. For those joining, we're going to start in a moment, uh, about two minutes past. Excellent, we'll be getting going in a moment. Uh, I can see we've got 33 people here. Wouldn't it be great to have a map of where everyone dials in from? Uh, we can't do that, unfortunately, but uh, it would be interesting. So let's get started. So welcome, welcome. This webinar is part of the Kubit series, which is an online forum by Portworks for Kubernetes practitioners like yourselves. And we'll be hosting sessions meant to address common questions and challenges we see from platforms and ops teams on the way to deploying Kubernetes. So be sure along to follow, uh, be sure to follow along for our future sessions. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started. We will have questions and answers at the end. So please feel free to submit your questions. You can do that anytime. We'll see them, we'll collect them up and make sure we get those answers. And the webinar will be uh, received, uh, sent to you thereafter with a recording so you can catch this on demand, share it with your friends and all that sort of thing. So here we go, let's introduce you to ourselves. So Daniel, why don't you tell us what's your name and where you come from? Yes, hi, thanks for joining. My name is Daniel Paul. I'm a cloud architecture at Portworks, so covering the, the German speaking market and I'm based in Leipzig, Eastern Germany. And yeah, thanks for joining again and back to Anthony. Great stuff. So I'm Anthony Hodson. Uh, I'm a software engineer by training. I was never a very good developer, uh, but infrastructure by experience, having worked in managed services as cloud emerged. And I worked for a DevOps software company in that space for a while, stood on a booth, explained what DevOps was as best I could. Very challenging. Everyone's got a different opinion, right? And then I went through hyperscale cloud as an architect, and this finds me here, right, talking to you about containers. And what's the point of all this change we've seen over, well, the last 15 years that I've been in the industry? And I think maybe power, control, automation, and ultimately the quality of the systems. So quality of the services that run on those systems that enables safety and speed for those implementing change. So systems which are less fragile, which can be made up of reusable parts for the purposes of getting us from an idea to something that someone wants or needs, right? Into the hands of your customers, whether those are internal or external. And software teams, you know, they call this nowadays velocity, right? It's measured, it's a goal. And this is a flywheel that gets your company ahead. 
Right, and if you follow the literature, I encourage you to look up uh, Accelerate by Nicole Forsgren and Jean Kim, uh, who wrote the Phoenix Project, right? looking into the science and the data behind this. We can show that a company's ability to deliver software change predicts the performance of that company, which is an important point. Right? We used to be seen in IT as a cost center, but that's been reframed. Right? We're now part of the engine, or if not the engine, right, the transmission that gets that rubber motion to the road. So we're really very important in this, and we're a big part of the puzzle, and we're able to help better outcomes for our companies, shareholders, or whatever your company's goals are. Right? So the current shift being moved to is one that brings portability operational ease and that velocity and that's kubernetes and kubernetes is google's brainchild released into the world to take on the market dominance which aws had built up and there's a really interesting uh, documentary on this over two parts that goes into how this is formed i encourage you to look at that give you a bit of a background on this uh, while you're traveling or on plane or something whatever is it's a good one uh, and Kubernetes is making bigger and bigger waves as we get through this, this time, right? So Gartner and 451 and all the others confirm that the trend is growing greater every day. So 95% of new apps are being developed in containers and 85% of global businesses are expected to be running Kubernetes in production within the next five years. Teams are starting to move workloads into Kubernetes, which are previously out of scope. So virtual machines are being bought in, for example, removing the need for hypervisors and their licensing fees. With Kubevert, for example, if you've not come across this, have a look at that project. And legacy applications, ones that you aren't refactoring because you don't have the code or you, you don't have the people who understand what, what it does to that degree, those are being pulled into containers using tools like AWS's apt containers, right? So this makes it a lot easier to get into this space. And databases are being brought into the platform too. So do look at Portworx Enterprise for how to make that safe as well. But we're here today to talk about backup. And all those workloads are stateful by nature and far from the intentions of Kubernetes initially, which was just for stateless workloads. But you can never control what your tools do after you release it to the world. People find useful things, and this is how progress happened. So there is no native solution for state storage in Kubernetes. So backup is the process which we use. It's what we spend our time doing, but it's not the goal. You know, restoration is the goal. And with an application consistent backup and that application consistent part is important, you can do so much more. So you could migrate between execution venues, admittedly with some um, downtime, but perhaps that's fine for your application. You could squash production bugs by getting an as it was in production snapshot recreated into a test environment. You could copy a system which has been compromised and examine it in a contained container space with forensics, right, taking the pressure off. You could recover from a disaster where the availability of the hardware is at fault by moving it. Uh, and this could be that your cloud provider has gone down or one of your data centers. Or you could recover from a disaster where your data is at fault. So someone drops a database, for example, or um, deletes the infrastructure, right? We create these environments with commands and they can be deleted with commands just as easily, whether from an inside threat or whether from just an accident, because we're all humans. Or you could recover from a definite exterior threat, right? Which is ransomware. You may not know that only 40% of ransoms that gets paid actually get their data back. So it's a huge problem. You need to have a plan and to create the plan now is the best time you've got. So we want compliant backups and we need to show that the backups are working and that they're in place by design and they cannot be removed in some cases like ransomware. And we need to show that they can be restored to other execution venues. And this is limited in the open source solutions like Valero, for example, this, this um, solution removes that limitation. And we want backup to be fast. And only to be fast, we only want to take the bits that are needed. So imagine the difference in speed between backing up a 40 megabyte application and backing up a 40 megabyte application on a virtual machine 
it's magnitudes more data to move around, right? Which means that you need a lot more switching equipment or you pay those higher fees as you move things across cloud, uh, in and out of VPCs in AWS and that sort of thing. And we want the backups to be complete. Talking, uh, taking the Kubernetes configuration along with the data in the system. So it's not just the data, it's the whole piece, right? And it needs to be able to come up at the other end. And my customers say, look, when, when you click restore, as they say, you know, it comes back up and you've got to be ready for that, right? You've got to have uh, all of these systems that are, are waiting for that to be set up as well. So uh, we, we take care of that too. And you want your application consistent backups. So the app should be the same after the restore as it was before. And that sounds simple, but it's not. And Daniel's gonna talk us through the challenges of an app consistent backup. I'll pass it over to you, Daniel. Yeah, so here we see a further breakdown of traditional versus Kubernetes storage. Traditional applications which run directly on physical or virtual machines have simpler storage needs than distributed containerized applications. VMs are more straightforward to back up. There is an app, this is tied to a single server, and backing up the server is sufficient to fully protect the application. Containerized applications are different. Containerized applications are purpose-built to be highly dynamic and traditional methods cannot support these modern architectures. They're distributed by nature. Backing up any given VM is likely to capture partial data from multiple applications while failing to back up complete data from any single application. Makes targeted backup and restore very difficult and time consuming with traditional backup. On top of that, backing up at the machine level, it could lump together applications that require different data protection policies. To support fast recovery time objects, backups must encompass the entire Kubernetes application. They also need to work at the container level rather than the VM level and able to backup entire applications across VMs, including their configurations. So yeah, next slide, please. So cloud nat native architecture makes data protection challenging. Containerized apps are built to be flexible, dynamic, and scalable. They're also built of more than just data. They have application configurations and objects. They need to be protected to be able to fully backup and restore quickly. Traditional backups, which are machine focused, simply aren't built to handle Kubernetes infrastructure. Traditional backup solutions simply capture the entire VM, which doesn't work for containerized applications. I'll get into this later. To fully protect your Kubernetes data, you need a solution that backs up at the container level and fully understands Kubernetes infrastructure. Traditional backup tools don't have Kubernetes namespace awareness and they can't integrate with the Kubernetes API, leaving no alternative to taking a manual backup of every machine or application. This costs your teams more time and can leave backups at risk uh, for data loss and human error. Beyond just costing more manual effort, traditional backups tools cannot fully back up an application. Like I mentioned earlier, you need to back up data, application configurations, and objects to be able to fully and quickly restore. Another big trend that we are seeing is that data protection is moving from IT to a shared responsibility among multiple teams, including application owners. Where traditional backup was centralized, container web backup provides application owners with self-service capabilities, including the ability to set up own backup policies and rules. This is huge as it prevents IT dependencies and siloed responsibility. Back to you, Anthony. Thank you. Uh, so to summarize, the risks are here, right? This is part of the why. And I'm gonna add some positives to that list, right? Um, what, what are the carrots in this scenario? Well, people perform better when they're confident, and confident that the systems they're relying on are working. So we're, we're all scared of heights to some degree, but we will stand by a window in a skyscraper without worry, at least after you know, that initial shock. And how do we tower above our complex systems without fear? Well, having capable backup gives us some of that certainty needed to execute at speed. For example, imagine the improved velocity if you knew your software you push into your pipeline had the handrail of having an application consistent backup taken moments before your code is pushed out to production. So that confidence that um, should there be a problem, a repair can be fast or even automatic with minimal disruption. 
makes you able to move at that faster pace, which makes your company more successful and makes you as an operator better able to sleep around. So Daniel, can I get you to uh, talk us through this one, please? Yes, sure. So Portox Backup is, is, is about um, protect your Kubernetes data everywhere. But why use Portox Backup? So it's about self-service backup for application users just in a few clicks or API calls. Um, you can run applications in production and self-service management empowers your application owners to centrally manage all backup and restore on their own. This makes it easier to backup and protect data just the way the applications owners need. So setting granular backup and restore policies all on their own with no dependencies on other teams. And this gives backup and restore policy setting to those who know best about the application. It's about recovering and migrating applications anywhere. Yes, you can use Peaks Backup to migrate your applications between different environments. So you can quickly backup and restore in a single click and fully protect all associated application data like configurations and objects with an application-aware container granular solution that was built to protect Kubernetes applications. Backing up at the application level instead of the machine level allows for greater efficiencies. You don't have to back up all these components separately in multiple machines, but this also speeds up time to restore. You can easily migrate applications between clusters, cloud and regions in minutes to any public cloud or on-premise environment. This provides a lot of flexibility in how and where to back up and restore. And this all guarantees you also protection against ransomware by using the S3 object locks and immutability features. And this is all about ensuring business continuity. A lot of cloud native data protection solutions claim that they do disaster recovery. However, they claim that simply backup and restore is complete disaster recovery. This is simply not true. Um, it's, it's still backup and restore, right? So Portworx Enterprise, our storage foundation on this, is able to protect your cloud native workloads against failures and outage with low RTO or an RPO disaster recovery for mission critical data. And this is additionally to PX Backup, one more piece in our data management solution. So back to Anthony. Thank you, Daniel. <clears throat> so we have a demo here. Right, I've recorded this one uh, for your uh, time. It always takes me longer to go through these things. But just say, if you jump into this um, free trial software, we actually have uh, some, some really good free offerings as well. And you can go through, we provide you with the cluster, we provide you with the apps, so you can go through and do it yourself. Right, this should be, uh, there we go. Here we go, so we're logging into this software as a service. You can deploy this as on-premises as well. We're gonna create a deployment. Uh, here we go, oh, are we in the wrong demo here? I think we're in the wrong demo, Daniel. Just a moment. I've been jumping between the screens. Right, we've given you a little preview there of the same principle that we have for Portworx data services. Now, Portworx data services, I will be talking about in a, in a few minutes, just at a high level. Let me just switch my screens here. Uh, which is democratizing database as a service into your own clusters. Right, here we go. I'm just going to change the screen here. Change screen, apologies. Stop showing screen. Now we're going to show. Here we go. Okay, you should be able to see this. You can see my mistake because they all look the, uh, the same interface. Here it comes. Okay, so we're in the same interface, central.portworks.com, which is the same place you would go to try our lovely Portworks data services here. We're going to select the software as a service option, which means that you don't have to run the data, the control plane for this, right? It's run by someone else, which is a good idea in backup if you don't need to have the on-prem side of things, because it means should there be a problem, uh, it's not something you need to look after. We'll look after for you with all of our other important customers. Okay, so we're going to create a name for the service here and it's gonna be provisioned automatically. I've never seen it take 15 minutes. It's more like five, so. Right, uh, there we go. So that's being provisioned, that's your own space. You can attach this to 
your OICD um, there you go, uh, authentication systems, so you can use your existing users and you can use RBAC and so on there as well. So here's our interface, right, where you will see your backups. We haven't got any at this point, but we have created two buckets in AWS for us to store the backups in. So we're going to use AWS for this backup as well. And we're going to use AWS as our source cluster, as many of you will, I'm sure, as well. So we need to create uh, a name for this. This could be whatever you want it to be. It doesn't need to be unique. And uh, we're going to create an access key, uh, uh, collect the access key and the secret access key for you as well. Uh, we're not going to share that, so unfortunately, uh, yeah, you won't be able to um, get uh, get Bitcoin mining on that one today. Should that be your forte? Uh, collect those up. Those are the only two things we need to authenticate with AWS. And we're going to select a region, which means if we create any storage buckets for our backups, which are easily done through the interface, uh, then um, they would be stored in that region as well. So what you can see here is EKS, so Elastic Kubernetes. AWS is managed EKS, uh, managed Kubernetes offering, one of them. Uh, and we've auto discovered those and we can just add them. Now, if you're installing your own EKS or you didn't have um, Stork, which is um, one of our components, you can install it with those commands. These things go in as operators into your environment. It's two lines of code to put them in. It's very easy. And um, yeah, it's a moment's work. So we've got those two clusters added. We're going to use one as a source and one as a destination, as you would expect. And we're now going to have a look at what's running in the first one. Here we go. So this is a web interface. We're just collecting up X, Y's where the mouse is clicked to create some unique data that is visually um, something you can remember. There you go. So nine database records there. And we've got uh, the ability to back up namespaces. We select what those are. <clears throat> so web app is the name of our namespace. Naming's hard, but uh, we've come up with this one. Informative, I'm sure. Now in this is uh, a list of everything that's in there that you can back up. Now you could back up a subset of that, you could back up all of it. We're gonna back up all of it, which means we can restore all of it nice and easily. So we're gonna click backup. Now we're creating an ad hoc backup and you can do this through uh, API calls if you prefer, if you want to interface with your uh, CI CD pipeline to do this automatically. We can also create schedules. So we're creating a backup to a non-worm backup. Worm means write once, read many. So this is a, a way of mitigating ransomware. So we've created that backup, we're going to create another backup and this one will go to um, one of those ransomware protected ones, which um, which uses in AWS something called object lock. And you set a policy that says, I can't delete this for seven years or one year or whatever you need it to be. And you can see that denoted by the little padlock. So that means there's a policy that, because AWS control the hardware, you know, can get to that hardware. It's FIPS compliant and you can back up and, and um, you know that it'll be there. Because the last thing in a ransomware attack they do is delete all your backups, right? Otherwise, you just restore. Okay, so we have both backups here. That one's object locked enabled. So if you can imagine uh, what might happen next in a backup ransomware demo, here's our application. That's all running fine. Oh, no, no, we've been attacked, right? All of our data has been encrypted. Uh, and the, the rate of encryption, I think, was 53 last time they did benchmark. 53 gigabytes in six minutes, something like that. It's um, it's fairly quick. Um, so here we go. Uh, we've got our original source cluster that has been compromised, but fortunately we've got a backup of it. Right, we're going to go over to cluster two with our backups. So we're just going to show you that there's nothing running in cluster two that uh, that has this web app. So note the absence of web app in there. And we're going to click restore. Right, so I have a look at all the backups. There's our last one. Notice the object lock over on the right. Noted with worm. Here we go. 
and we're just going to take restore. We're not going to take long because it's something like 37 megabytes. Give the name to the restore because you might use this restore multiple times. Select your destination cluster. You could restore to cluster one, but probably whatever was in there is still in there and could still encrypt your data. But if you weren't in a, a ransomware protection and sort of where you could click restore, uh, replace existing resources, so you could install over the top and we'll take care of that removal of the old stuff and instigation of the new stuff, or the new old stuff as it were. So that's our app, it's been restored. Uh, it's gone in nice and quick, uh, it is very small. So let's have a look, right? We need to see if it is now running. So there's the web app, it's been up for 75 seconds. So we've sped this up for you a little bit. Right, and we're gonna look at what the endpoint we need to get to that web interface that we're familiar with is. So we're gonna grab that load balancer. Oh, it's an IP actually, there you go. I say IP, it's clearly not an IP. <laughs> Here we go, so let's get rid of that horrible screen there and find ourselves back at our running application. There we go, it's up and running, and you can go on about your business and do some clicking now. Right. Carry on as you will. So that is our demo of uh, Portworks backup. It's very easy for you to do this yourself. Uh, I would describe this as a lunchtime proof of concept, and even if you, know, uh, if you just wanna move things between one environment and another, just to see how it works, this is a good use case for that as well. So, let's see, can you see my screen? Here we go, okay, right, let's go to the next screen here. Okay, can you see that? I might just need to change my share, bear with me. Okay, stop sharing screen, start sharing screen. Here we go, okay, so we've seen backup here. Right, so companies, uh, here's a challenge. We see companies move, uh, they need this to be in place as they bring stable solutions into Kubernetes. And they've got this foundation of recoverability uh, for your backups, right? And we've taken the risk and effort out of those backups as you've seen, uh, and we've shown that to be the case. But there is other stuff Portworx do, uh, does, and I'd be remiss not to share with you because they will help on your journey there as well. So Portworx started with Portworx Enterprise, which is a persistent storage tier that underpins anything you do with stateful workloads in Kubernetes. So if you need high availability, or you need automation for your storage so that you're not expanding things and doing all that toil, or you need encryption, or you need zero data loss, disaster recovery, for example. Portworks Enterprise will help solve those problems. But you can learn more about this as well. Uh, we'll put this in the chat um, with uh, an on-demand webinar in this case. So you can learn more about that. Um, I know that's not what you came for, but it uh, fits in the Kubernetes puzzle. And then the next piece, which I tried to show you a demo of inadvertently, is Portworks Data Services. So this is the last here at the top. And it's the thing that you're actually after, right? Is the data services without the need to manage, without the need to understand how to put these data services together. Database as a service has been a big part of the appeal of public cloud. It makes customers sticky to public cloud, which allows them to, you know, um, they keep, keep you on the platform and, you know, it makes it hard to move to other more cost-effective solutions. But Portworx Data Services brings this same experience into your clusters. Now, um, Daniel will be giving a talk on this in a week's time. So you can go and uh, have him answer your questions and see how it all works. And he'll show you that demo. I, uh, I sneak peeked at you earlier. So. Um, We've come to the end of the set piece here. Uh, it'd be good to get any questions from you that you have. And uh, yeah, otherwise, you know, we'll, uh, we'll show you some, uh, some places to get started. But yeah, if you've got any questions, please do, um, do send them in now. I'm more than happy to go through those with you. Very good. <clears throat> Yeah, so we run uh, we run on premise. I just say we do also uh, do air gapped 
installs of these things. So a lot of our clients have uh, a requirement because we work with a lot of um, healthcare providers, we work with a lot of telcos, we work with a lot of um, financial institutions who require this stuff to be installed in an air-gapped way. Um, it means um, you know you, you couldn't usually consume the software as a service option, so you do need to run this stuff yourself. And then when we think about where these backups go, these go into object stores. So things like S3 is a piece there uh, which you can use. Um, you could send some to S3 and some to another S3 compliant object store as well. So something like Minio is a way a lot of clients do it. Uh, we're also going to be able to target NFS locations as well in the coming releases. Uh, I think it's the next release we'll have a, uh, an NFS target. So if you're not really into object stores, we can do that. Of course, we can take backups from um, uh, NFS as well. If that's helpful to you. I think, Daniel, we've answered everyone's questions with our presentation. And there's um, a good number of people who have attended um, so and stuck it through. So I really appreciate you sticking around. Uh, if you are frantically typing, we will take the, uh, the questions as well. But, you know, I, I alluded on my LinkedIn to uh, a digital goodie bag. Well, we have boldly, uh, I think, um, offered a free forever software as a service one terabyte of kubernetes backup for anyone who wants to get started with portworks there's no cost you don't need to sign up with a credit card all you need to do is um, read and tick a box that says we agree to these um, terms you know as, as you do with everything have a read of those and you can get started with kubernetes backing up one terabyte of your your estate, which for a lot of customers starting out is is their entire Kubernetes estate, right? Uh, for free. If that's not big enough for you, if you need to store more, we can do a 30 day free trial, which gives you full access to that. And all those other offerings we had for Portworx Enterprise and PDS, we can do trials as well. Um, and we'd love to hear from you. Uh, so do connect Daniel and myself on LinkedIn. And um, I really appreciate your time today. And I uh, will be available for any questions on LinkedIn, Daniel, as well, uh, if you want to get hold of us after this presentation. We also have some, some more questions in the Q&A section. Oh, great. Um, so yeah, it's, it's quite difficult with, with, with this tool to, to see them as a presenter, but um, and now I can see ah, them. So, great. so yeah. there's, there's one question about how do we prevent malware from being backup and or restored? Well, if the malware sits inside your, let's say in your, in, in your data, we cannot prevent this from being backup because we backup your data. In the general architecture, it, it's quite important that we, we store all, so we, we backup um, all the, the, the volume claims um, of your applications and also all the configuration data. What we do not backup basically is the container images and most of the malware comes out of those container images, let's say it this way. So this is about uh, container image security, supply chain security, all this stuff. So in general, we don't have functions to, to prevent um, backing up malware or stuff like this. This needs to be covered on, on another layer. It's like, it's like you can. backup tools. Yeah, and it's that strategy, right? You, I, I can tell you that the, um, the, the point of your concern here is what they call in uh, ransomware the dwell time. So you know, I think in 2016, somewhere around there, this was a much bigger number, like 97 days, something around that. It's actually the dwell time on average now is 21 days, and it was 26 days in, I think, 2020. So 2021 is the latest data I've seen on this, and it's 21 days. And the reason for this is that ransomware has become a, uh, a business. It was always a business, but now it's a business for hire. So you can, people ransomware as a service, and they want to see those things change. So it doesn't typically dwell as long as it used to, but having a backup strategy, which means you keep a weekly backup, for example, and a monthly backup will allow you to get to that consistent state before. And also, once you've worked out what caused it, 
find out when it came in. So that's that's there as well. And you know, as I said, take a, a running app that's got um, got this uh, a problem, whether it's ransomware or something uh, more less disruptive, more parasitic. You can take that out, put it somewhere else, and have a good look at it with your team with that application consistent backup. Oh, were there any qu other questions, Daniel? I'm clearly not that good in this interface. Yes, so there is a question about how many applications can be migrated in parallel. Is there a maximum? Well, that's a good question. I actually don't know a number of parallel, let's say, restore jobs because essentially Portflux Backup is a backup and restore tool. So the question is about do we have a limit on parallel restore jobs? I actually don't know how to start. Yeah. I you know don't that. know that limit. No, but I will tell you about uh, one of our clients in the States um, who, um, who, met, who tried to add 10,000 um, nodes to our system at once. And, you know, we'd never tested with that size. But we released a, a fix to that within a week uh, that allowed them to do it. So the moral of this is we're very much built for scale on this, right? So we're not we're not looking at you know people with a hundred nodes. It's it's big scale, and we design things in a way that allows restore uh, to happen in parallel. For example, you're using a, a an object store which is not you know you're not pulling from a central server using an object store that's built for massive scale particularly in s3 so it's been built for that um we would be happy to um to explore this further with you as to you know how much you'd like to restore at once it's no problem. yeah and and one remark from my side i also try to answer it in the in the in the, in the q a section if application migration between kubernetes cluster is a topic for you which is really relevant uh, you should also check the the migration capabilities of portwork store which does not need this way of creating a backup job running a backup and restoring the backup to another cluster with portworks enterprise you can just uh, create a, a pair of clusters for example you have an on-premise kubernetes cluster with portworks and you also have a eks cluster with portworks and then you can create a direct link between those clusters and migrate all your applications or you can not, not all you can migrate your namespaces um, from one cluster to another and this can be done in a one-time job doing a migration or this can also be done um, in, a, in more in a case of a disaster recovery protection which then runs uh, on, on, on a scheduled base which helps us helps you just to to migrate all the kubernetes objects all the data to the other cluster and then restore in the case of a disaster if you're interested in this just just ping me um, i have a ready presentation for this because i i presented this at, at, at the container days in hamburg and also at, at different other um, events so yeah just ping me directly so did we miss any other question? I don't think. So as far as I can see, other questions have been answered. Yeah. Andrew, I can't hear you. Uh, it, it, <laughs> Talk to myself. I do most of the time. Uh, yes, well, thank you very much for joining us. Um, really excellent questions. Uh, hopefully this was useful to you. Hopefully um, you've learned that you can get a terabyte free backup, um, which will help you on your journey no matter what. And uh, yeah, we're, we're open to any other discussion. So um, let us know. But yeah, have a great day and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks for joining. Bye.